Hello, everyone, and welcome to this, uh, the Sacroidosis Treatment Patient Webinar. So my name is Kel Hansen, and I'm one of the two co-hosts of the event. So I'm also the chair of the European Lung Foundation, that is a patient-led organization with a patient-driven agenda that works internationally uh, to bring patients and the public together with healthcare to improve lung health and advanced diagnosis, treatment and care. So I'm extremely pleased to be here uh, at this first treatment guidelines patient seminar. And you might also want to look up some of the web resources that we have uh, either now or later on perhaps preferably later on. So the guidelines are published in the European Respiratory Journal and the lay guidelines are published on the health website. And you might also be aware that there is, a, or there has been an event on the, the European Respiratory Channel on the management of psychedosis. But here it's all about the patients and we are here to talk about guidelines and the purpose is to increase the appeal of the guidelines and to make them easier for patients to engage with. First, I would like you to meet our sarcoidosis experts. And I would like uh, each of our six experts to present themselves in their own language. Bonjour à tous uh, de Paris. <laughs> Bonjour à tous de Paris aussi. Buonasera a tutti, io sono Paolo Spagnolo e vi saluto da Padova, dall'Italia. Buongiorno e benvenuti. Hola, soy Jacobo Sellares de Barcelona, eh, Spagna. Dobar dan svima, pozdrav iz Beograda. Hello, this is Bob Hoffman from Cincinnati in the United States. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for being here at this event. We look very much forward to hearing what you have to say. So one of the other points of this webinar is also to have a multilingual event, and this is perhaps the most advanced multilingual, uh, multilingual event that we ever had. So we have tried to make the, the webinar more accessible and to have the main presentation available oh. to watch in nine languages oh, in addition to English. So we are hoping also to have an expert from Germany, but unfortunately that could not be arranged. However, if any German speaking attendees would like to post their questions in the chat, then we will try to answer them after the event also. And now I would like to, I would like for you to meet my co-hosts, Filippo Batone. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Filippo Martone. Thanks, Kelt. Um, I'm very, very pleased to be here. Um, I am the president of the Italian Association of People Suffering of Sarcoidosis. Uh, I have the sarcoidosis too, and I am a doctor. Uh, I'm very uh, proud to be here because uh, as a patient, I think that guidelines could be a very fantastic tool for the doctors to take in charge of all of us. And this can be a very important moment to comprehend and to share as a doctor and as a patient, uh, how, uh, can, how can helpful could be this tool. So uh, I have some uh, little housekeeping things to, to tell you. This is a, a Zoom meeting, obviously, so please keep your mic down, but you, if you want, you can keep your camera on. Uh, please note that this webinar is recorded. As we have just met them, we have experts from the task force present who can speak English, French, Italian, Spanish, and Serbian. So please write any question you have about the guideline in these languages in the chat box and they will answer as many as they can. We will try also to answer any unanswered one after the event and post them on the ELF website. We cannot guarantee however to answer all the questions. Please note 
that the expert cannot answer a question about individual personal circumstances or cases. Great. And now I would like to talk to you about the organizers of the event. So the organizers of this event is the European Respiratory Society with their medical experts and then the European Lung Foundation that facilitates patient engagement. In particularly, we would like to thank the chairs and the members of the EIS Sarcoidosis Treatment Guideline Task Force, and that includes the patient representative and the ELF Sarcoidosis Patient Advisory Group. Most of them are joining us today, uh, so you might meet them here on this call. So we have a brief outline of the program as well. So we are now coming towards the end of the welcome. We have a, a few more minutes. Then we will have pro presentations from professors Bo Bauman and Dominique Vallier. We will have video patients input into the guideline. And then we will have a breakout rooms where there can be questions and answers. We will also look then to have a small session on feedbacks from the questions and answer session in the different languages. So everyone will meet back in the main room and we aim to close on the hour. So we have made the main uh, presentations pre-recorded in eight languages and these include Chinese, Danish, Dutch, French, German, Italian, Serbian, and Spanish. So if anyone wants to watch the presentation now, then they can go to the ELF events page where you can select the video in the language that you want to watch it in, and then come back to the webinar afterwards. Filippo. Thanks, Geert. Um, I am very honored to introduce you, uh, Professor Bob Boffman from Cincinnati, USA, and Professor Dominique Valère from Paris, France. They are the very beating heart of the uh, ERS task force for the, uh, diagnose, the um, therapy guidelines for the sarcoidosis. And so please, uh, Bob and Dominique. Thank you very much. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of uh, Dominique uh, for this. And I think the title of this is very appropriate since this is understanding the guidelines. Uh, next slide, please. This is the task force itself when it originally um, started in 2017. And you can see that there's a large number of people, including uh, Dr. Matone and um, Dr. Uh, Guardra, uh, patient representatives. Next slide. And the guideline development process is very specific uh, these days for various conditions and what they call are grade recommendations. I'll get into this in just a minute. It's important that if you use these high levels of evidence, it can be very useful, not only for helping to understand how your uh, care can be given, but also for other people, including healthcare providers and insurance companies. Um, to make decisions about coverage for various care. So these documents um, often go through a very uh, tedious, long process. This one took four years from the initiation till the final publication. Next slide. Next slide, please. So these are the, what we call the PICO, the questions that we looked at, and they were looking at specific indications, including pulmonary and extra pulmonary, cardiac, neurologic, we also looked at manifestations of sarcoid, specifically fatigue and small fiber neuropathy. And we made specific recommendations for seven of eight of these period. Next slide. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Sorry, I'm getting into some technical problems here. Could some, there we go. So the grade format allows you to make recommendations uh, either for or against a particular question, such as should you use corticosteroids for pulmonary sarcoidosis? And the recommendations can be either strong or weak, but also they can be um, 
of levels of evidence. And unfortunately, in sarcoidosis, there are not a large number of, of trials that we consider uh, adequately controlled for all the drugs that we use. There are some drugs that have been studied, um, but not nearly as extensively as other conditions such as asthma or uh, cancer. Next slide. So um, the guidelines were published with a key, just like any map. And the key tells you about two things. One is it tells you about the strength of the recommendation and the quality of the evidence. And if you look at the guidelines, there's a nice color code put together initially by Peter Corsten, who was unfortunately unable to participate in this uh, today's seminar, but he helped us um, clarify as we went through the guidelines so that you can look at this map. And so you have a grade of recommendation and it can be strong or conditional. Current practices where we don't have enough evidence to support a specific recommendation, but most committee members did use these therapies. And then there are some cases where a case by case basis where you've failed other treatments and there's still something else to be considered. And these were also considered by the committee. Not all treatments were, uh, that have been proposed for sarcoidosis are in the guidelines. Those that are in the guidelines have been used by the majority of physicians who were part of the uh, guideline committee. Next slide. So a recommendation can be strong or it can be conditional. A strong recommendation means that most patients in this situation would want to do this recommended course. And that most the prescribing physician or clinician should prescribe this recommendation. And that for policymakers, uh, that recommendation should be adapted as a policy in most situations. And with that means also covering the cost. Next slide. So as an example of a strong recommendation, do not add voice rat poisoning to your cereal. So I think most of us would agree that that's a recommendation that you would give to your children. Next slide. A conditional recommendation. Well, this is a majority of the people in the situation would want the recommendation, but not all of them. And there, there were many who would say that they don't necessarily want to that recommendation. From the clinician's point of view, it, it is your job to point out that this could help the patient, but the patient and the cl clinician have to make the decision on a shared decision process. And from a policymaker, there needs to be some debate about recommendations, but they should, again, support these recommendations since there is evidence to support them. Next slide. So a conditional recommendation is do not add expired milk to your cereal. Well, there are still some people that may want to do that in special cases, but the majority of the time, we recommend you not use expired milk. Next slide. There's also a general underlying premise about treatment for sarcoidosis, that there are only really two major indications. One is to avoid danger, either loss of life or loss of organ, such as vision. And the other is to improve quality of life without necessarily a risk of uh, loss of life, but still having a very impact on your day-to-day -day activities. Next slide. So this is the major recommendation map. And I'm gonna go over this in a little bit of detail, but this is what we're hoping to focus on today. And for patients in this example, for pulmonary sarcoidosis, there's a group on the left that are low risk. That is that they're not risk for loss of organ function or do they have impaired quality of life. In those situations, Recommend. And no specific therapy for those patients unless there's an assessment need for treatment and change over time. Next slide. The patients at high risk for loss of organ involvement, of course, respiratory failure, or even death, there were specific grade recommendations. And the number one grade recommendations was the use of corticosteroids as the first line treatment. But it should be pointed out that it quickly into the first line treatment that you have to see not only a good clinical response, but a successful tapering of glucocorticoids because we felt that this was a strong part of the any recommendations. The patient should not be left on high dose steroids throughout the course of treatment. Next slide. Next slide, please. What about... Um, patient input. Well, this was a survey we did with the European Lung Foundation a few years ago, and we found that uh, the this was a multilingual. The most important factor, that is towards the left, is quality of life and functionality. Um, mortality was an issue, 
But probably the biggest thing that was not a problem for the patients, the least important, was pulmonary function tests. And so we tried to educate physicians and healthcare providers that when you're looking at quality of life, you have to get the input from the patients. Next slide. So this is the intermediate risk or paired quality of life. And these follow the same guidelines that they followed for high risk. But unfortunately, there is not as much evidence because these specific inputs into say improved quality of life have not been studied with these drugs. So if you're taking, for example, corticosteroids for your improvement in your quality of life and you're gaining weight and feeling miserable, you and your healthcare provider should probably rethink about giving you steroids if it's just making you miserable and not improving your quality of life. Next slide. We did make recommendations for um, manifestations of sarcoidosis, as mentioned before, and there are specific guidelines for skin, cardiac, neurologic. There are specific guidelines for sarcoid-associated fatigue with several treatment regimens that had great recommendations. Sarcoid-associated small fiber neuropathy is a well-recognized, and the committee felt it was important to highlight it, even though we could not make any great recommendations for treatment. Next slide. So in conclusion, the ARS has developed specific guidelines regarding treatment. Um, for patients, great recommendations have been made on the basis of available evidence. There are other therapies that are in the guidelines that were made by the committee. And for those treatments, there are specific information about when to use them and how to use them. And we felt that these guidelines should be helpful in the management of your care. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for this very nice presentation. Uh, and I think it's it's really impressive the way that you're able to communicate uh, that message. So I would also like to thank the, the, the members of the task force that had uh, helped to pre-record the main presentation. And you might find the videos still, if you miss them, in multiple languages on the ELF website. And uh, I see the link has been shown uh, multiple times and will probably be that again. So now I would like to move on to uh, videos made by two of the four patient representatives in the group. And uh, that those videos will show the importance of the patient involvement in the project group. Hi everyone, we're just having an issue with the sound. We're just trying to sort it out now. to bring into the working group our patient experiences and also the different experiences of the patients and caregivers from different countries because also the different national healthcare systems do have an impact on uh, the problems and 
available treatment options and of course on the reimbursement schemes we could strongly promote that also general symptoms which have not really a good treatment option like fatigue or small fiber neuropathy could be taken into account to look for answers in the new guideline so we were very thankful that also in the new guidance it is expressed in the text where to go for future research and what is needed there. This was also a good experience to see uh, the confidential collaboration between uh, different associations and different patient advocates and also with the medical associations and the psychedosis experts from Europe and US. We are hoping for easy to understand by the doctors, of course, the general practitioners, the pulmonologists throughout the world know these new guidelines and uh, hope that also the patient seminar now we're working for can give this as a tool to the patient, this new guideline, to go with it uh, for his doctor and to ask for maybe treatment recheck and maybe some new ideas can be used for the individual treatment of sarcoidosis patients through the world. And therefore, that's what we hope and promote, that also the patients should use the patient-friendly version published on the European Lung Foundation's website. La partecipazione dell'Associazione dei Pazienti al Task Force per la definizione delle linee guida è fondamentale. Questo perché le associazioni possono portare le priorità dei pazienti per meglio orientare la definizione delle linee guida stesse. Partecipare alla Task Force sulle linee guida per la sarcoidosi ci ha consentito di poter porre l'accento su un elemento molto importante che è la qualità della vita dei pazienti stessi. La comunità di lavoro tra medici e pazienti è all'interno delle task force ulteriore garanzia di possibili sviluppi futuri laddove queste linee guida siano mancanti in alcuni aspetti e quindi poter garantire una continuità di sviluppo. Le attività di advocacy delle associazioni spesso e volentieri sono loro stesse un elemento che sollecita la definizione delle task force come è successo nel caso della Task Force per la Sarcoidosi. Per le associazioni è molto rilevante poter partecipare a queste Task Force perché questo vuol dire poter disseminare le informazioni, quando questo ovviamente è consentito, verso i propri pazienti e i medici curanti. Grazie. Now we have the chance to ask questions of the experts involved in de developing and the guidelines and we have set up so, some Q&A breakout rooms for different languages in French, Italian, Spanish and Serbian. Questions, uh, questions in, English, in English will remain in the main room and links to the language rooms will appear on screen shortly. Click on join for language you want to take part in. We will then come back together and at the end of the Q&A session, we will have 30 minutes for participate to the question and answer session. If you look at the um, the list, you if if you want to stay in the English room, then you don't need to do anything. But if you want to join one of the language rooms, 
then please click now on the language that you wish to join. Sorry, guys, how do I enter the Italian break room? Breakout. You should see on, on your screen, if you scroll down at uh, the breakout rooms, there is one called Italian. And uh, on the right, there is a, a, a button, click join. I don't see. Uh, it's uh, under more, Pablo. Then maybe you first have to go more and then breakout rooms. Do you see it there? Yes. Okay. So is in uh, okay. Sessioni secondarie. Italiano enter. Okay. As we're going into the breakout rooms, um, I would suggest that there are two ways to, um, to if you those of you wanting to stay in the English room is to go ahead and either go through the chat box or to raise your hand um, and if you want to give a verbal question. Is that correct? Yes. Um, if those who are in the English room would like to start asking their questions, either post in the chat uh, or turn on your camera and ask a question sure. then, or raise your hand, then uh, Bob will do his best to answer them. For those of you who are not um, Zooms, raise your hand is under reactions. So that should get you tied up. Uh, Claire, you asked a question about sharing the slide. If you could just go ahead and put the, the task force slide, which is, I think. So I think you have your first question, Bob. So you have a question which asks you to easily explain sarcoidosis. Yeah, I saw that when I was trying to avoid it. Um, I, I think that for a, a thumbnail discussion about what is sarcoidosis, that it's an inflammatory disease of unknown cause. Inflammation like you see with rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, um, but it is different because it tends to affect uh, different organs, the lungs most of the time, but other organs, including the brain, the heart, the eyes. It is also different from rheumatoid arthritis and other inflammatory disease because of the fine, the granuloma is the cause of the inflammation. So that's, I think the easiest way to tell your family and friends is that it's a form of inflammation. Although a third of people it goes away, two thirds of the time it can be chronic and about half of those people end up needing long-term treatment. Another question I've gotten um, is that how long can one be on third line therapy? Well, once you get to chronic treatment, that is needing disease treatment beyond two years, which is only about half the people who need treatment need it for more than a year or two. That has become chronic. 
And in our experience, that means about 10% per year will eventually go away in that group. And that doesn't make any, that doesn't any different if you give methotrexate or prednisone or infleximab or third line therapy. And I have patients on drugs like infleximab for now 10, 15 years since we first introduced that drug almost 20 years ago for sarcoidosis. Um, what should be done if your physician does not want to accept or follow the treatment regimen? I think that this is a discussion that you have to have with the physician about why they don't want to use it. Are they uncomfortable with the treatment regimen? Um, sometimes a pulmonologist may not be used to using drugs like infleximab. And in that case, you may want to ask about seeing a rheumatologist or someone else who's used to those types of drugs for other conditions. Drugs like rituximab and um, adilimab and um, infleximab are used commonly by rheumatologists for things like rheumatoid arthritis. And there's more than a million people on those drugs in each, for each of those drugs. Um, treated on a day-to-day -day basis. What are the recommendations for a relapse, especially during uh, the last trimester of pregnancy? Well, relapse itself, it usually means that you have to go back up on the medicine. Usually in the first reaction is to start all over again with prednisone. In pregnancy, there are certain drugs that we should not use during pregnancy. Methotrexate is um, very harmful to the fetus and part of the uh, early ap morning after pill for uh, spontaneous abortions. Uh, infleximab is also recommended not to be using pregnancy, although there's more data. Uh, but basically, especially in the last trimester of pregnancy, the safest drug is prednisone. Uh, prednisone is used actually to help mature the baby if there's premature birth. So we know it's a fairly safe drug. Its major side effects are in the first trimester of pregnancy. Can healthcare insurance refuse to pay for treatment according to these guidelines? Well, yes, unfortunately, we have no um, authority over healthcare providers. However, the recommendations of using drugs such as infleximab do help usually healthcare providers, and especially in the United States and other countries, point out that there are great recommendations, and they usually follow these recommendations, not only for um, sarcoidosis, but for cancer and such. Um, when can we expect guidelines for other manifestations and examples for given bones and joints? We think that um, this should be the next round, but we'll need more data. There are only a few case series of bone, for example, not much else. How many patients on long-term prednisone would develop secondary adrenal insufficiency? It's a good question. This is related to the dose, and the higher the dose, the longer it is. I don't think that the adrenal insufficiency is an irreversible phenomenon. It just means you have to get off the steroid slow, slower. Um, um, one of the questions is about pulmonary hypertension and sarcoidosis. I'd like to point out that uh, that's an important um, complication of sarcoidosis is usually seen with patients with advanced disease, especially fibrosis. We have published recently a set of guidelines uh, in the European Respiratory Review about management of pulmonary hypertension in sarcoidosis. And those patients <clears throat> with uh, advanced disease and persistent dyspnea, I refer, you might want to look at those guidelines. Um, the next question is about vitamin D. Uh, vitamin D is a complicated problem in sarcoidosis because patients with um, sarcoidosis can have hypercalcemia, that is too much calcium either in the blood, but they can even go on to kidney failure or kidney stones. At least 10% of people have it. The reason they do is they have too much of vitamin D, the active form, which is called the 125 or calcitriol. There's an enzyme in the granuloma that overconverts that. And you have to check that level. So often the vitamin D25, the one that's normally checked, is low because they're overproducing it. So we usually recommend that you, before you get started on vitamin D supplementation, that you get both the vitamin D25 and 125. In a study that we did of over 300 patients, we found that only one patient was low on their vitamin D125, and that's been seen by other centers that looked at it. There is a risk of giving too much vitamin D that you can get the kidney failure or kidney stones. Um, the next question is about what about the patient who has both rheumatoid arthritis and sarcoidosis together? Um, this to me is always a, makes it a little, little bit easier because methotrexate, a drug we uh, stole from the arthritis people because it's a safe steroid sparing drug. Then the next line of therapy like the anti-TNFs and fliximab and adilimab are easier to give. And the indications are pretty much the same. I think if you have advanced pulmonary sarcoidosis then you should be treated with more aggressive treatment. Um, the next question about cardiac sarcoidosis, uh, the question about sudden death. 
The sudden death of cardiac sarcoidosis is really basically associated with arrhythmias. Um, so if you have palpitations, if you had, certainly if you've had passing out spells, you should be evaluated for possible cardiac arrhythmias due to sarcoidosis. And the major test that you do in that way is screening is an EKG where they simply look at your heart rhythm and then you do a monitoring test. We usually do a 24 to 48 hour monitoring. You wear basically an EKG monitor for a day or two and they download it. And patients with known cardiac sarcoidosis and arrhythmia usually have thousands of skip beats in a day. So it's not a subtle call. And the reason why we look for it is because we know that if you have an ICD, which called an which basically a pacemaker and defibrillator placed under your chest. It's not much bigger than a, um, an old uh, cigarette uh, lighter. It's very small, it functions very well, and it has been shown to reduce the chances of dying from cardiac sarcoidosis. So the, um, the guidelines very specifically state that patients who have arrhythmias from cardiac sarcoidosis should have an ICD, and those with known cardiac sarcoidosis should be screened for arrhythmias on a regular basis if they don't get an ICD. Next question is about kidney stones. It gets back to the calcium issue. Um, if you have kidney stones, you need to find out whether it's related to your sarcoidosis. If it is, and the reason you have it is because of the high 125 that I mentioned before, calcitriol, then you need to treat that as an indication in your treatment. Treating physician would use drugs such as hydroxychloroquine, sometimes low-dose prednisone, sometimes more. Um, how high is the risk of steroid-induced um, diabetes? Well, diabetes is certainly a complication of sarcoidosis. Uh, treatment with steroids, the higher the dose, the more problems you have. It doesn't directly cause, uh, steroids don't directly cause diabetes, but they cause it in two different ways, uh, problems with your sugar in two ways. One is weight gain. Steroids tend to make you want to eat everything in sight. And they tend to block the effectiveness of your own body's insulin. So, if you start having problems with your sugars, and certainly your physician uh, needs to treat it, but at the same time to work on steroid sparing drugs if they haven't already done so. Uh, I've gotten two questions about leg cramps. Um, we didn't specifically address this, this is what we, um, because it's actually kind of complicated. One of the major reasons to get leg cramps are actually corticosteroids. Another is um, patients with chronic respiratory symptoms will hyperventilate and they'll get leg cramps because of their this, and these are nonspecific but problematic. If you have bad leg cramps in the middle of the night, you know that it's not a trivial problem. Some cases, quinine can be helpful for this. Um, uh, other cases, you have to go on things like uh, gabapentin, sometimes can be helpful. And uh, those are things you need to talk with your primary physician. Check the potassium because rarely that can cause it. Um, is there an increased risk of lung sarcoidosis in patients with autoimmune diseases? Well, sarcoid, I don't like to call it an autoimmune disease, autoimmune disease because sarcoidosis is formed by granulomas, and that is not seen in autoimmune diseases. And so, um, in theory, there shouldn't be a crossover between the two. I do, however, see quite frequently people who, who have sarcoidosis, who have other family members, who have other conditions such as lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis. So I think the inflammatory genes are shared, and there is evidence for that in the genetic studies we've done to date. There is no specific uh, gene for sarcoidosis. Uh, there is one that for uh, Lufgren syndrome, but it's still, you also have to have something in the environment. Is there something like recommended clinics for patients with complicated sarcoid? Well, I'm glad that question has been raised. We have worked in the World Association on developing what are called centers of excellence. And there are 48 centers of excellence across the world. These are listed in um, the WASOG, W-A-S-O-G website. And uh, they were first developed two years ago. We have quite a few centers now reapplying for their Center of Excellence. And the next update of that guide will be in the next few months, I hope. How can shortness of breath on exertion be improved without increasing the steroid dose? Um, this is the whole point. If you're still having symptoms on prednisone, the knee-jerk reaction in the past is to increase steroids. My reaction would be to give more medications, that is to go down the next step. You know, methotrexate, which will work about half the time. And if it fails to work, then move on to a third line drug, such as infliximab. Can you repeat the U that URL? That's for somebody else. Um, I can't um, repeat that. It's probably for Pepe, if she's still around. So I think that um, being an idiopathic disease in your film, 
uh, research have failed to find the triggers, genetic triggers. Are you a betting man? What would you wager on? Okay. Well, the, I can, you can use that same comment about uh, any idiopathic disease, including asthma, for example. Um, but I think that um, like other conditions, I think that there's two factors that make it difficult. One, I don't think that there's going to be a single gene that's associated with sarcoidosis. I think it's going to be a combination of genes. I think as far as the trigger, there's enough evidence now to suggest that at least three major factors can induce a sarcoid-like reaction. The first is the Japanese who have looked at uh, a bacteria that causes acne called P-acne. Another is the studies from uh, Vanderbilt and um, Johns Hopkins in the United States saying that maybe an atypical form of tuberculosis. And the third is in the United States, we saw a big outbreak of um, epidemiologically of sarcoidosis in the first responders to the World Trade Center, which was associated with an inhalation of a large amount of dust. So all these factors can lead to granulomas and in the appropriate clinical setting with appropriate genetic setting, I think this is what led to sarcoidosis. It's important to realize that the, um, it's not just an simple infection, a study led by Wander Drake giving uh, four types of antibiotics that should have treated any P acne or atypical mycobacteria was unsuccessful in treating sarcoidosis. We've had a question about fatigue. Um, I think it's important that fatigue should be, this is especially a group that you should realize that fatigue is a common manifestation of sarcoidosis. It's seen in at least 50% of the time and it has impairment in quality of life in those people. But in some people, it's an overwhelming problem. I think that's at least 10 to 20% of my patients will have fatigue. Because of this, we looked at what evidence had been studied and there are two evidence-based recommendations, meaning that um, we felt there was sufficient data based on randomized trials. One is for exercise, and it didn't turn out to be any specific type of exercise, just a regular exercise program three times a week seemed to randomize fatigue. And the other were for two neurostimulants, and these are studies done at our institution. They were only single center studies, and which is why the recommendation is conditional, but drugs such as um, methylphenidate and uh, modafinil, which are used as neurostimulants for thing, and used for things like attention deficit disorder, can help short-term fatigue. And be, they're only really useful in the day they take, and they do have some problem with addiction and get used to taking them, but they can be helpful. How do you screen for multi-system organ involvement and how frequently? Well, I think the physician and the healthcare provider usually has a checklist. They ask about palpitations, they ask about headaches, do they ask about vision problems? They ask about the level of breathing, shortness of breath. Um, as far as blood work, things like calcium and kidney function and uh, liver function tests probably need to be checked on a regular basis, at least once a year. And I think of also what symptom you use treating the patient for, the target organ needs to be monitored on a regular basis. Um, Starlers being the first line therapy or other drugs in the research pilot to use for first-line therapy. Well, Jan Gruder's group and uh, Marcel Feldkamp are doing a very interesting study with upfront therapy comparing prednisone versus methotrexate. I think that this is, if it is a positive trial, it's not going to be useful for severely affected patients, but I think for quality of life patients, patients who are somewhat moderately impaired but not severely impaired, it may make sense to give methotrexate upfront. We tried to do this study several years ago and we were unsuccessful in getting patients enrolled because it takes a few months for methotrexate to kick in. For a, however, a steroid savvy patient who understands the side effects, waiting a few months may be worth it in the long run because you don't take any prednisone. A question about CRP. Um, what is the best treatment for high CRP? Um, do you use these tests to help men? In fact, we don't find the CRP that useful in sarcoidosis because 20% of patients with sarcoid do not, only 20% have elevated CRPs. It is interesting though, if your CRP is very high, you're much more likely to respond to infleximab than those with a CRP that were low that were being placed on infleximab. It was, both groups did respond, so um, it's somewhat useful. And just like the SED-RED and the ACE level, I think they're only really helpful as indications of inflammation but a negative test should not stop you from therapy. The next question is the PET scan. And here we have a little bit more support um, for using this as an indication. The reason this ACE level, for example, is not useful 
uh, is because it is suppressed by prednisone, meaning the level will go down if you put somebody on prednisone, a normal healthy person's level will go down if you put them on prednisone. So when you take away the prednisone, the H level will go back up again because you're no longer suppressing it. It may not mean that you need more treatment. On the other hand, the PET scan does seem to be useful. This is being studied uh, for pulmonary disease in some clinical trials, and it's being used more and more for decision-making in cardiac sarcoidosis, where physicians will often use the PET scan as indication if there's still ongoing inflammation on PET scan to give more treatment. As far as the ACE levels, that's come in a little bit later, but it's, again, um, it's only really helpful, I think, in my mind in patients that um, it shows that disease is present. In chronic disease, it's only elevated about 30% of the time, kind of like the CRP. And it's just one more indicator. If you're, in the, if you're complaining about your disease being worse and you want to know whether there's still inflammation, because if you still have inflammation, we have all those drugs I've shown you for inflammation. Before you, if you have an elevated ACE level, an elevated CRP, or an elevated PET scan, that would be, in my mind, uh, more support for the idea of making decisions to make treatment. But I still think the bottom line is the decision to treat is going to be based on you and how you feel, not necessarily on any particular blood test. It's just supportive. There's a question about a stubborn sarcoid patient with myositis with an elevated CK, MRI, or PET scan. That is just somebody that doesn't seem to be getting better with current therapy. Um, they're looking for a better imaging tool. I don't know that there is another imaging tool that we have right now. There are some other ones that we're looking at, but there's not enough evidence to support them. I think that the stubborn part of it has to get back to whether you're stubborn because the imaging is still abnormal or whether the patient is still having symptoms. If they're having still symptoms, then you may want to get more aggressive treatment. Um, going to third line therapy. And in fact, in our clinic, it's, we would sometimes give do dual third line therapy, giving things like rituximab and um, infliximab, which can, uh, makes the cost much more elevated. But if you're feeling good and you're having minimal symptoms and your MRI is still abnormal or your CK is still mildly elevated, I don't think you necessarily should be on more treatment. And this is one of the reasons why we try to point out the quality of life is the primary input for many of our patients, let's say 60 to 80% of the time. And the final decision about treatment, therefore, should be the patient, not necessarily the physician. There's a question again about the Wausauk Center. So um, there are two uh, registries that have been put together. One is the Wausauk Centers, mm -hmm. and these are just centers that have registered themselves with, with the World Association. And there was no real vetting of them, but to, to fill out the paperwork and such, you had to do some so that you were familiar with the disease and familiar with the Wausauk group. To become a center of excellence, as I explained before, required more vetting. We went through that. We had a formal process and we'll be redoing a formal process of renewal. So uh, the comparison between the centers and the center of excellence, there is a difference. However, I would point out that not every good center for sarcoidosis has gone through the process of becoming a center of excellence. Uh, there are lots of physicians who are aware of, aware of taking care of sarcoidosis, do an excellent job of it, and who've never uh, registered. Rheumatologists, for example, for the most part, have not been part of the Wausauk Center of Excellence. So your phys individual physician may be well experienced with sarcoidosis, but if you're looking for a, a second opinion or third opinion, that's where I would go. Why does it, in the United States, sarcoid seem to be original? Uh, regional. Well, that's an interesting question. We don't really know, but we clearly know that if you take the Mississippi River, which splits the United States in half, the eastern half of the United States, northeast and southeast have more sarcoidosis, about twice as much in the western part of the United States. And this is not just a racial issue. It is something else about it. And we're still working our way through that. But I think that part of it is probably um, experience and part of it may well be genetics. Uh, comments about COVID and sarcoidosis. Um, there were a couple studies that were done actually with the help of the ELF and several uh, groups, including the uh, nice part uh, done with the Italian group and the uh, Dutch group and Spanish group. Uh, so we know that patients with sarcoidosis were actually not that much um, more affected by it, but they were two to three times more likely to get COVID than the general population when COVID first came out. Uh, as time went on, it became clear, though, that the treatment for sarcoidosis and they, um, did not make the disease that much worse if you got COVID, with the one exception, rituximab. 
In fact, some of the anti-inflammatories may actually have blunted this because we, if you got hospitalized for COVID early on, the first drug you got was steroids and then other drugs that are anti-inflammatory. As far as the impact of the vaccine, um, we've been doing serial studies and what we saw at our institution, the vaccine um, reduced but did not eliminate the risk of sarcoidosis. But over time, we've seen the risk of severe disease as measured by hospitalization to go down. There have been occasional patients who have had a worsening of their sarcoid symptoms after the vaccine. This may just be the usual worsening that occurs in patients or it could be related to the vaccine. We're still trying to sort that out. Um, and the Dara Swice has got an uh, analysis going, ongoing of a questionnaire that we did through this. So I think that as in many parts of COVID, the, the landscape keeps changing. But fortunately, it seems to be changing to the better. I would, however, if you uh, take the usual precautions, and if you do get COVID, certainly the uh, anti monoclonal antibodies when they were available, and now with the oral treatments, seem to be very effective just as they are for the general population. So I think that we are ready to go back to the other route. Is somebody monitoring that for us? Hi, Bob. We've got three minutes left. Oh, we do have three minutes. Okay. Um, so I've got a couple more questions. And the uh, one is asking about uh, sarcoid centers in the UK specifically, um, and talking about the fact that uh, you're in your center, you have a general practitioner and then hospital consultants that only manage particular organ systems. And I think that's one of the reasons why we like to think in terms of centers of excellence, somebody who would take over the full management. Uh, very frustrating to a patient with sarcoidosis, say of the eye, when they go see the pulmonologist and say, there's nothing wrong with me because your lungs are fine and your eyes are getting worse. Um, so I think that that's where the centers of excellence, they are listed for the UK. There are a couple centers of excellence. And it, you know, I, as I understand the usual system in the UK is that you can be centered, sent to the centers of excellence. I know at least one is in London. So one of the things we're gonna be doing as we go back to the breakout is we're gonna to try to summarize um, some of the issues that came on uh, from the group here. So I will try to cut together some of those. So I think that one that I would particularly like to talk about is fatigue and vitamin D have been not been discussed by others. Uh, one question asked about whether it affects differently around the world, which I think is something we'll also hear about a little bit for the breakout sessions. Uh, I think that there is a clear cut there difference in different parts of the world. Some of this is racial since the African-Americans and the French African um, and uh, African, North Africans in Holland have much more skin lesions, for example. Japanese tend to have more cardiac disease. Um, it's interesting that Chinese have more hypercalcemia and the question that was asked about was uh, in, in India, they don't see much hypercalcemia, which I find kind of interesting. I think you would have thought of that the um, vitamin D issues would be a problem there. But we do know that African-Americans, so, um, with their melatonin levels, seem to have less hypercalcemia. So it may be the same reason for India. I'm given that I've got one more minute. So I want to emphasize to you, and hopefully that you shall find useful these guidelines as a map and help you understand where you're going. And I think that it is something you can talk to your physician about. These grade recommendations, like in other diseases, are well recognized as specific recommendations. Uh, and that should be helpful for your physician or healthcare provider about what the next step should be. Everybody should be coming back to the main room now.
Fantastic. I think we are getting everyone back into the main room now. So I hope that you had a, a good time in the breakout rooms and had the opportunity to ask all the questions that you wanted to ask. And if not, we will also sum up some of the questions on our website following uh, this event. So welcome back everyone to the main room. Now it's time to summarize some of the Q&A uh, experiences and, and questions. And I would like to ask each facilitator in turn to give a brief summary, one to two minutes, depending on our time available, to give a take home message based on uh, the questions and answers that have been in the individual sessions. So I would like to uh, first invite the Italian room. So Paolo, if you please. Yes. Sarò molto breve, I will be, will be very, very, very fast. Essenzialmente i, i nostri pazienti dicevano due cose, che eh, le linee guida purtroppo spesso non hanno una risposta alle loro domande e questo riguarda soprattutto disturbi come dolore, per esempio, oppure la fatica. So essentially they were saying the document does not have a response to some questions like fatigue, for example, or pain, which can be a big problem for the patients. E il secondo problema era che spesso, se non si ha a che fare con centri di riferimento, si ha la sensazione di essere un pochino abbandonati o non seguiti a sufficienza. So the second is that unless you are referred to big centers, the referral center, you feel kind of isolated, that they don't understand you completely, and uh, you feel, you know, this kind of loneliness. So I would say, questi sono secondo me i due grossi problemi, soprattutto per pazienti che hanno una sarcoidosi severa. And this applies particularly to patients with severe sarcoidosis. Thank you so much. If we can go to the French room and Dominique. Nous avons une discussion très animée. Plusieurs patients sont intervenus. Euh, il y a eu d'abord une question sur euh, la méthode GRADE. Les patients avaient besoin de comprendre à quoi ça sert la méthode GRADE et puis comment on doit interpréter l'efficacité des traitements en dehors du GRADE, ce qui a amené à discuter finalement euh, l'utilisation euh, d'autres façons euh, d'avoir les médicaments, comme euh, utiliser une quatrième ligne de traitement ou rentrer dans un essai thérapeutique. Euh, il y a une patiente aussi qui a beaucoup parlé à propos de sa dyspnée, de son essoufflement, qui est son problème principal et effectivement ça a permis de développer sur les différents mécanismes euh, possibles d'essoufflement dans cette même maladie qu'est la sarcoïdose. Euh, Qu'est-ce qu'on pourrait dire encore d'autre Oui, le, le, les patients s'inquiétaient, enfin, en tout cas ont posé la question de savoir si tous les médicaments convenaient à tous les patients Et la réponse, effectivement, est non, et c'est ce qu'on leur a expliqué, d'où l'importance d'une médecine un peu personnalisée, c'est-à-dire de décisions thérapeutiques partagées à condition d'y passer le temps nécessaire, que chaque médecin explique le bénéfice-risque, les effets attendus de chaque médicament, et puis donc la décision sera réellement partagée. Et ça, je crois que c'est un point qui a été apprécié enfin, le fait que nous nous intéressions en tant que soignants à cette question, je crois, à intéresser l'ensemble de nos interlocuteurs. Et enfin, dernier mot, c'est l'importance des centres de référence et de compétences lorsque la sarcoïdose est difficile à traiter. Donc, les patients doivent pouvoir avoir recours à ces centres. Voilà, merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Dominique. And I would like to, to thank Violetta for being available in the Serbian room. Uh, I hear, unfortunately, there weren't so many Serbian patients 
in attendance, so I will jump to the Spanish room and Jacobo. Gracias. Pues en, yo diría que podría resumir en dos tipos de temas en nuestro, lo que ha, en, en nuestra eh, room. Eh, uno primero han sido respecto al tratamiento, eh, directamente hablando del task force y sobre cómo eh, eh, co congeniar lo que es la calidad de vida con el efecto del tratamiento en, en los órganos y evitar los efectos secundarios y cómo eso pues, pues, pues hacer que sea mejor. ¿no? Y luego y había dudas sobre esa aplicación. Y luego sobre otro tema que ha sido creo que también el más importante es el tema de que eh, muy, las dificultades que tienen en algunas zonas de, de nuestro país de, pues, para poder acceder a los especialistas en sarcoidosis ¿no? y de la manera en que cómo podemos mejorar ese network para que la, para el paciente eh, pues haya más homogeneidad en el territorio sobre eso. Uh, if, I have to, if I have to do the summary of the main two subjects that we have talked in our room, first one was related to the corticosteroids and the, the uh, side effects of treatments and clearly how to decide when to treat or not to treat. So this is something that is important for the patients, uh, especially because some of the treatments could uh, affect the quality of life. And the second one was more, more focused on the, the problem that we have in our country in some areas that we can, patients cannot access, uh, especially since sarcoidosis. So it's, there is a bit of heterogeneity in our country and also have some difficulties to access some therapies depending on where you live. So this is something that we are, uh, that we will say that we're trying to, to improve uh, from a national perspective. And I think that uh, things like this task force could help, you know, to, to do things better in, in each country. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jacobo. And finally, we will uh, go to Bob and the English room. Thank you very much. Um, I think a lot of the discussions we already had are a couple issues that I wanted to bring up. One was that uh, we talked a bit about fatigue and vitamin D. Fatigue in particular, there was a, a great recommendation, so I would uh, point back to those. Exercise and neurostimulants have been shown to be helpful. Uh, vitamin D, you need to get the levels checked. Those were things we discussed. As far as the centers and referral, I would emphasize that the World Association, WASOG, has developed uh, a center, Centers of Excellence program. There are 40-some centers across the world that are Centers of Excellence. There are also listed centers that have registered with WASOG. I'd emphasize that not all sarcoid experts have uh, done this. Not everybody um, is aware of WASOG, for example, the rheumatologists or the ophthalmologists, so you may have a good physician, but if you're looking for a second or third opinion, in your country, I would one of the places to go would be to the Wausau Centers of Excellence since we do a betting process. That's going to be renewed and uh, for all the centers, hopefully in the next few months. Uh, thank you. Okay, Ian, I think that we are going to the end of this fantastic meeting. Uh, as you heard, uh, there is a great thing that patients and doctors meet and stay together to share what the different point of view can give us to grow, to go for a better quality in care of the people and to work better as, a, as a doctors because you have to, fo to focus how uh, you can be helpful to your patient and no one than the patient can tell you. So thank you, thank to ERS, to ELF, thank to our key speaker, Bob and Dominique, and for the, uh, and all the uh, Component of the task force. Thanks to the ELF Sarcoidosis Patient Advisory Group for their friendship and for their work and for all the things that we are doing together. Thanks 
to the ERS Task Force member who translated the presentation and facilitated the rooms, uh, Professor Benstrup, Professor Bonella, Huey Wang, Professor Israel Beat, and Salares Spagnolo, Professor Valer, Dr. Feldkamp, and Professor Vucic. Thank you very much. I remember that recording in English of this event will be available in the ELF website and uh, that we can keep in touch and, and have more information about sarcoidosis uh, connecting with this website you can see on these slides. Uh, thank you, Kielt, uh, for all the work and assistance that the ELF can provide us every day. Uh, I hope that this is uh, this could be uh, the first of other meeting like this, in, in that let us uh, share together information and work. Thank you, Regina. Bye -bye. <laughs> is this the end yes that's too bad so see you all very soon hopefully and thank you to thank you so much thank you to filippo and all representative and jen hansen thank yes. you so much it's been great to talk to the patients and to talk with you so really let's do it again soon Fantastic. Thank you all. Thank you so much. I'm sure we will do it soon. Okay. We are ready. <laughs> That's great. Arrivederci a tutti. Grazie mille. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. 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 Bye all.